something really scary happened on Halloween that I'm still processing. I promise I have eyebrows. I'm recording this on Zoom because I'm in a different situation and it kind of looks like I don't have eyebrows. I think they used to be darker when I was younger. They keep getting lighter. And so now sometimes in certain light, it looks like I don't have any. Anyway, so back in May, Abby in the Objective Personality Facebook group made this fun post about how to curse each social type. So Abby wrote, this would be more fun around Halloween, but but I can't hold on to ideas. So she meant it would be funner if I posted this closer to Halloween, but she couldn't like, uh, you know, hold on to the idea for that long. So she did this back in May. It was about how you might curse each of the social types. So for one, she said, may every win be because they let you. For two, may your project always have to be fully redone twice. And for three, may your key ingredient always be on back order. And for four, may all your family be social ones. And then, you know, she opened it up to brainstorm, like what would be fun and clever ways to curse each social type. So it's Halloween about a week ago, last Thursday. My anxiety was already kind of high because my partner was going out of town in a couple days and he just hadn't been out of town in a long time. And I have like just a lot of observer fears about feeling like if he leaves, I might never see him again. He might never come back because he could be in an accident or like a natural disaster disaster could separate us where he wouldn't be able to come home or all the things that could go wrong, like the pipes break and the house floods when he's gone. The sink actually did start leaking and I fixed it because I'm not useless. So I did actually repair the sink. So that was good. Anyway, my anxiety was already kind of heightened. And then I was scrolling on Facebook. It was about 5 p.m. I had almost made it all the way through Halloween without anything scary happening. I'm scrolling on Facebook and I see this post that um, this is making me cry. The ceramic supply store in my town is closing. And so this is the number three curse. This is the number three worst nightmare. So Abby... <laughs> This is all your fault. No, not really. Um, it's just a coincidence. But I just thought that was such a crazy synchronicity. And I remembered her post, but I didn't remember the part about referencing Halloween. I just remembered that it was a post about cursing each social type and that the curse that she designated for social type three was happening. <laughs> My worst nightmare was happening. And then I went back and read the post and she was referencing Halloween. So I was just like, oh my God, what a crazy coincidence that this is happening on Halloween. Halloween. And I'm still processing just is bringing up a lot for me related to social three and specializing in my art in ceramics. And then also some play last fear of chaos, or maybe it's demon SI fear of chaos that this is all bringing up. So it's bringing up all of this pathways tension, observer tension about pathways related to my ceramic specialty. And I already have a lot of this even without the store closing but this just sort of amplified it. And I'm going to try to talk about this, but I'm so confused and unclear. And there's such an enormous tension between being OE and a social type three. I'm just kind of like a mess in my specialty. I have also been a massage therapist for 20 years. And in that realm, I sort of have it all dialed in. I'm not successful in terms of being financially consistent, but I don't really know a whole lot of massage therapists who are. That's just sort of how it is. But there there is a lot of consistency in terms of my marketing strategy and my systems, my workflow and systems are very tight as related to massage. But for the art, it just isn't. There's a lot of tension and conflict there. And having the art supply store closed is a huge, huge significant barrier. Ceramics is very expensive. You almost need to make a profit in order to keep doing it. Or I do. If I was independently wealthy, I would just do ceramics. I wouldn't have to worry about making money in order to buy more supplies. But that's sort of the situation that I'm in. It's hard for me to even talk about this because I'm so confused and unclear about all of it. There's a lot going on. For First of all, monetizing my art has been pretty awful for me. I really like for it to be a hobby because it's just too much pressure. If I won the lottery and I was independently wealthy, the artist side of me would just make the art, just be alone in my workshop with the art, making art for art's sake. And I would hire a marketer and a product photographer to pimp my art for me. There's all this stuff related to my art that I don't want to do. I just don't enjoy product photography. I don't enjoy listening 
listing things on Etsy. I don't enjoy keeping up with the social media and all the posts to market the art and make sure that it sells. I would love it if someone else would do that for me. The profit margins are also extremely difficult. One of the things that's really frustrating for me is when I post on Facebook, ceramic, art projects sometimes, but also with sewing projects when I make a dress. This is just a hobby for me. Sewing is just a hobby that I do for myself. I'll make a sewing project, post it on Facebook, and everyone is like, oh, that's amazing. You could sell that. You should sell that. And they don't know all of the ins and outs of how challenging the profit margin issues are with sewing, with fabric, with marketing art in general. Like in order to do something like that successfully, the product line has to be cohesive and repeat especially on Etsy, the platform that I'm using, because you want the algorithm to tune into a specific product, like say this earring, a blue ceramic, zero gauge flower earring. So you make a sale of this earring, it triggers the Etsy algorithm and directs more people to this earring. So you have to have more, you have to have a constant supply. And if you run out, then you fall in the algorithm. So you have to be really organized. You, you want to have at least some products that are popular and repeatable and you don't run out and they're all identical because if they're not identical, then, you know, Sally buys these earrings and then she comes back and she says, I love these earrings. So I bought another pair for my friend Jane who will also love them. But the ones that Jane got, they're not exactly the same. Um, handmade art is, there are variations, but with some Something like Etsy, they have to be at least similar enough. I can't even talk about this. <laughs> there is this OI part of me, this um, masculine SI OI part of me that wants to just repeatedly make the same thing over and over again. But then I'll see a little improvement. I'll make it a little bit better. And then I will literally throw away the old stuff and start making the new stuff. I'm crazy. It's like this weird tension between OI and OE wanting to do the same thing over and over again. And that feels really relaxing. But then I also want to try all these very variations and iterations and I get distracted, shiny idea syndrome and I jump. And then in terms of the marketing and selling the art, I cannot stick to a strategy. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't want to do in terms of marketing and product photography. I don't want to be responsible for that, you know, in typical three fashion. I just want to do the specialty, keep improving, but not worry about all the other stuff. And then ultimately monetizing the art just sort of like kills it for me. I really would prefer to just just be independently wealthy and just do whatever I want, experiment, buy a bunch of different supplies and make stuff and then just leave it up to a marketing team to pimp that stuff out. So back to the ceramic supply store closing, it feels devastating to me because I can't just pop over there and get what I want. So I'm still processing and trying to decide what is my next step going to be. My initial reaction was, okay, that's it. That's the end of ceramics. There's no ceramic store. So I'll never do ceramics again it's over, you know, just like typical observer breakout fashion. That's the end of that thing. It cannot exist anymore because there's this observer dilemma in the way. But then I try to be calm about it and think like, okay, what are the possible pathways? How can I proceed forward? And then I see a whole bunch of pathways and I feel kind of paralyzed, but I'm also doing uh, some double observing. There is actually a ceramic supply store up in Portland. So that's like over an hour away in a really huge chaotic city that I'm not familiar with. That brings up a lot of play last fear of chaos stuff for me. And I feel like a freak because people in this town in Eugene, Oregon, most of them, almost all of them go to Portland regularly, like for fun. Like there's a show up there or they're visiting friends. They go for a weekend or they go up there to go to a specialty store to, you know, do some shopping or go to a store that they would only have up in Portland. People do this all the time. It's so normal. I haven't been to Portland in at least seven years. And when I went there, I didn't drive myself. Someone else drove me and it was for my sister's wedding that was up on a farm near Portland. So I'm trying to double observe. There is a ceramic supply store in my state, but I'm just thinking about the hurdle of being super organized and saving up a huge chunk of money in order to make a trip up there once a year or twice a year and get everything that I need. 
the financial barrier is significant. And I'm thinking like to go up once a year to get everything I need, I'm going to need a huge chunk of of cash. Whereas if I'm just zipping across town here in the town where I live, it's like, oh, I can, you know, get a little bit of this, a little bit of that and get by and keep the whole thing going. I'm not necessarily aware of like how much money I'm spending over the year. And I'm probably spending less. I don't know. It's just, there's, I'm sure this is really boring. To, and I can't even talk about it because it's like so confused in my head. So there's the chaos of driving to Portland. I'm afraid to drive to Portland by myself. First of all, I can't because my tires are really not roadworthy for an interstate trip like that at high speeds. I really need new tires. I mean, I just kind of go for these super short trips around town. I honestly hardly ever leave my house. And every time I do leave my house, there's so much chaos out there. I'm afraid even for short trips. So like yesterday, I took my youngest dog over to her friend's house for socialization so she could go like hang out for a few hours. It's like 10 minutes away. On the way back, I saw a cyclist get hit by a car. And it's like every time he's okay, but it was still horrific to watch. It was like he had just gotten groceries. He had all these groceries in his bicycle basket. He was going home or wherever, going on the crosswalk. And I think that either the light turned green or the the car just got confused. Like maybe the the left turn thing was green and he got confused and he just like inched forward. So he inched forward and like hit the cyclist and the cyclist came off the bike, but didn't fall down. I don't think I don't remember that part. Anyway, then he got up, the cyclist got up and he was like, it's okay. It's okay. I'm okay. And then he went over to the other side and, and then the traffic went, the Prius left, it was gone. And then I saw the cyclist on the corner and his wheel was totally bent and he looked super bummed out. He's got all these groceries in his basket. How's he going to get home? His bike is fucked. You know, maybe he doesn't have a vehicle. Anyway, every time I leave the house, I see crazy, stupid stuff like this. Running red lights is really regular here. It just feels dangerous to go anywhere ever. But even aside from the danger, because like, yeah, I'm I'm probably not going to die. I mean, I could probably not going to, but it's just the the financial not worth itness of even getting in a minor fender bender, like your insurance premiums going up, having to potentially repair your car if it's more than just cosmetic damage. You know, you got to pay money. I don't have that money. I can't afford to get in a fender bender, and I see the dumbest stuff every time I leave the house. I can't believe it. I see people in traffic and they're literally like scrolling on their phone while they're driving. I mean, this is, I just don't trust anybody out there. I'm so afraid of chaos. So I'm not going to drive myself up to Portland. I'm going to have to convince my partner to take me up there. Getting ceramic supplies shipped is an issue because a lot of it's heavy. There are some lighter, lightweight things that I use that I could ship to myself and um, it would still cost shipping, but it wouldn't be like crazy expensive. But in terms of like shipping heavier things, like a big bag of plastic, If you're buying wet clay, when I used to live in Eastern Oregon, I would drive to Portland seven hours or six hours and I would buy half a ton of clay in and put it in my truck and drive it home. It's like, I can't do that. This was when I was young and stupid and I had money and I spent all my money on craft supplies. I can't afford a half a ton of clay. And just think about like the gas that you would use when your truck is loaded down with half a ton of clay. Well, now I buy powder clay, so it's not. Anyway, yeah, that's techie specialty stuff. Anyway, just like a a bag of powdered clay and I mix it myself, but it's still like 25 or 50 pounds. So shipping that to my house is just not, just doesn't seem like an option. So I'd have to convince my partner to drive me up to Portland once or twice a year. I'd have to be super organized. I'd have to have a whole bunch of cash in hand to put in a large order in order to keep doing this hobby that I do. I have an Etsy store. Do I close it? Do I just put everything on extreme discount and just like get rid of it all and not do Etsy? Do I try to think of a different Etsy product with stuff that I can do, like some sort of like little sewing project that I can do and just not do clay? I have a bunch of supplies right now. What do I do with them? I'm taking some time to think about it. And I think what it makes the most sense to do is go and look at all my supplies and get some creative inspiration about a bunch of stuff that I can make for Christmas 
for friends and family, not worry about the Etsy store at all. It's like, I'm not making very many sales anyway. I made a lot of sales in like 2020 through 2022. I was basically like living off of the income from Etsy. Since then, sales have gone down a lot for me and for a lot of Etsy shops. So I don't think I'll close the store entirely. I have to pay to keep it open, but it's not like that much. I don't know. Some of the clay and stuff that I have is going to dry out. So it's like maybe I should just make a bunch of stuff right now and try to get inspired about Christmas gifts and then maybe like clean it up and put it away for a while and, and not do ceramics for a while. Oh, and by the way, back to the chaos and the driving thing. I wasn't always like this. I used to be more adventurous, maybe maybe naive even. When I was in high school, I went to a boarding school and it was an international school also. It was based in Arizona, but people from all over the world went to school there. So the breaks were really long, like Christmas break and spring break, because some of the kids would actually get on airplanes and like go back to Europe or wherever they lived in other countries. So it, the breaks needed to be longer so that they could do that and like spend some time with their family. And on those breaks, Thanksgiving, Christmas, spring break, I would get in my truck all by myself. I didn't even have a dog and I would drive all over the Western United States. And I didn't even really have a direction or an itinerary. I was just driving. It was mostly about sleep processing. I think it was about feeling independent and autonomous and being on the road and sleep processing because you have that rhythm of the miles that sort of like facilitates sleep processing. But anyway, I would sleep in the back of the truck at rest stops, which I wouldn't do now. I mean, like a 16 year old girl sleeping in the back of a truck in a rest stop without even a dog, without even a can of mace. Like it just seems like a little bit crazy. Um, sleeping in at camping grounds by myself. I don't know. It just seems kind of sketchy. But back then, I was a little bit afraid of the road, but just not like I am now. I think it's just like being so poor and seeing bad things happen and just the understanding that a fender bender could set me back so far or like breaking my arm would be the end of my massage therapy career because I've already done it 20 years. It's like how many months is it going to take to recover? If I break my arm on it, I might as well just get a different job and um I don't know. Anyway, I'm not making any sense. My main point is I'm horrified and I think the coincidence about Abby's uh, post was just crazy that that all happened on Halloween. I should probably go now because I'm really rambling. Um, okay, bye.